thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, good afternoon. My name is Derek Pratt, and I'm the Director of Education and Public Programming here at the Erie Canal Museum. I uh, thank you very much for joining us today. The impact of the Erie Canal has been immense, socially, economically, politically, and artistically. And that impact is still seen today, continually evolving as the Erie Canal continues to be a place of innovation and change. Uh, today, we're looking at one such instance of Erie Canal-based innovation in the arts. Uh, this is our first lunchtime lecture of 2022 uh, with this year's theme, yes? Uh, 2023, excuse me. Um, I'll fire the person who writes my intros. Oh, wait, it's me. Um, with this year's theme being art. Uh, our next lunchtime lecture is on February 23rd and will only be virtual uh, for now. I know David, our speaker, um, one of the speakers there, uh, is on the call today. Hey, David. Um, uh, and that's because we've got a couple of speakers from a ways away. Uh, those are Mary Alexander of the Arkell Museum in Canajahari and David Brooks from Skahari Crossing State Historic Site. And they will be presenting Perennial in Frame, Art and History of the Mohawk River and Erie Canal. This laid back, fun and engaging presentation will look at the Arkell Museum's extensive collection of Mohawk Valley and Erie Canal art and tie it to the history, memory and revitalization of the Mohawk Valley region. Uh, this year, I'd like to remind everyone, you can also sign up for the annual lunchtime lecture pass new this year, where you'll be able to automatically be registered virtually and in person uh, for all lectures and receive a recording of all of the talks uh, as soon as they're done. Uh, you can, um, like I said, choose to either attend virtually or in person, mix and match as you want with the, the annual pass. Uh, don't miss another lunchtime lecture and eliminate the hassle of signing up monthly with this new feature. But now on to today's event. Errol Willett is a professor of ceramics in the School of Art at Syracuse University. And he will be talking about his work as a ceramic artist and how he became part of a research team called Haptech Lab. The team has been studying the intersection of architecture, ceramics, and digital technology, and more, uh, specifically the use of robotics to bring new design potential to architectural ceramic panels used for exterior siding on buildings. Haptech Lab is made up of architects, designers, and architectural, oh, no, and digital fabrication technologists in collaboration with Boston Valley Terracotta, a major architectural ceramics design manufacturing firm in Buffalo, New York. The team took on the Erie Canal as subject matter for testing some of the possibilities of the new technology. Uh, some of the group experiments are currently on view in the Erie Canal Museum's link gallery right over here uh, and outside in the canal, in the Waylock Building's canal pit. So right over there. So if you're here in person, check them out after the, um, the talk. And if you're on Zoom, try to get on down here uh, when you can. All right, so now enough of me talking. Here's Errol. second view of your face. So now it's just. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. And um, <clears throat> thanks to the Erie Canal Museum for having me and for allowing me to put up this project in their museum. Um, I do have to thank CNY Arts and the New York Foundation for the Arts for a grant that helps support this project. And I know we advertised robots, and we're going to get to the robots. But I thought I'd introduce myself first a little bit. Uh, like Derek said, I teach at Syracuse University, and my wife and I moved to Syracuse in the late 1990s to take on this job at the university. And when we did, we bought an old hardware store building in Fabius, New York, just south of Syracuse. Uh, it was an abandoned building, but it had been the town's hardware store for 100 years, and we've converted it into a home and studio and gallery called the Gandhi Gallery, which is my wife's last name. She's also an artist. 
Um, and we put on shows there for a num number of different artists. We represent artists from all over the country. And although we both have expertise in ceramics, we also show other kinds of work, painting, photography, uh, sculpture, et cetera. Uh, so if you're ever out in the Fabius area, come see us. Um, here's one of the robots we worked with. And I'm, this is just a teaser, but um, uh, this is in a lab in Toronto, uh, Ontario, Canada at uh, Ryerson. It was called the Ryerson University School of Interior Design, and now it's become Toronto Metropolitan University uh, recently. But this is in their creative technology lab where they have all kinds of uh, digital tools and robots. And here we are trying to make the robot cooperate with one of our ceramic pieces. But before we get too far into that, I just want to give you a little background about how I, how I wound up here at the Canal Museum, making a piece about uh, a robotically tooled image of the Waylock building. Um, and just show you some of my work uh, and then how I kind of got connected with digital technology because my expertise is in, in handmade ceramics, uh, hand-built, wheel-thrown, uh, slip cast, all kinds of hand building processes, um, but not in digital technology. So I'm going to take a quick look and see just through some images if we, if we see a connection by the end of this talk. So this is some current work I'm making. These are about 24 inches wide. They're meant as serving dishes or platters, but also as sculptural objects and uh, also connected to an interest in baskets and basket forms and basket making. So I'll show you a number of these pieces. They're all fairly large, large for functional ceramics. Um, this piece, there's a video of how to make this piece on a site called um, Ceramics Arts Network. Uh, and here's one with four handles. And I'm really kind of interested in these handles and how they draw the eye through and around a piece and uh, create these uh, bisecting patterns, which is something we'll see later in the digital work. Um, it's another recent basket form. I also make a more kind of standard type form. These are about 18 inches tall. It's another round basket, another one. And these are uh, made in stoneware and glazed and fired in kilns up at Syracuse University. Um, and with all the interest in sort of containers in ceramics and vessels, and also in contemporary culture in terms of bags and, and how we transport things, I started making these shopping bags. They're about 25 inches tall. They're fairly large. Um, made some series of these shopping bags. I made a handbag. Uh, and this is all fairly recent work for me. Some older work was more sculpturally based and thinking about sort of combining different forms and the sort of sense of uh, mutation rather than evolution. Um, I made a number of pieces. Uh, this goes back farther in, in my art making where I was working with chimney flue liners at a factory in Pennsylvania. And so I've always had sort of an industry connection with my work. Uh, they would give me the tubes that you would put in a chimney as a chimney flue liner and I would soak them in water and soften them up and reform them into sculptures. These are about four feet tall. Um, I also got into uh, interest in French espalier fruit trees and the idea of sort of controlling nature and made some large wall pieces. This is about uh, 20, 20 feet by six feet um, and hangs on a wall in Casanova, New York. And I got into some wood-fired tile. This is a tile floor I did. Uh, all the tiles are fired in an Anagama, traditional Japanese wood kiln for seven days and, um, and then mounted and grouted like any other tile. And this piece was uh, out of an interest in Islamic pattern. And this is referred to as Islamic circle pattern. And it's made up of, I forget how many, but like, uh, quite a few um, bowl shapes that are kind of boat, boat shapes with pools of porcelain clay in the center. And it's on a bed of pea coal, uh, which is an interesting material because it's very precious looking and also very filthy. 
and unprecious in terms of reality. But um, here's a detail of that piece. And then I want to, as a teacher, as a professor in ceramics, I'm interested in anything that new that's going on in my field. And I want to bring that to my students. And so I've been watching the evolution of digital ceramics. And I'm going to show you some of the things that are going on that are really some of the pioneers in this type of work. This is an artist named Brian Saibes, who's working uh, at SUNY New Paltz. And he's been uh, doing some amazing things with 3D printing clay. And so the 3D printing technology has been around a long time uh, and been used in industry, but it's starting to trickle into ceramics and ceramic artists have figured out how to make a printer that prints clay. And I'll show you a number of pieces that are coming out of this process. This is also Brian Saibes. This is one of his cups, quite beautiful work. But you'll start to see a commonality. I don't know if this reads very well on screen. It's, it's a white clay, white piece, but uh, I think you can see it a little bit. Here's the interior. And one thing about the 3D printed work is what you do on the exterior also creates uh, an echo or a negative on the interior, which is uh, it's an interesting sort of component to that work. Some more of Brian's work. Also the interiors of pieces can take on these geometries and patterns as well. Um, here's a whole bunch of little test studies that are coming off 3D printers that almost feel like coil building, but they have such a rhythmic patterned quality that's um, really not anything people can do uh, with hand work alone. So it's, it's been very interesting. Artist named Del Harrow is also investigating this on the west, western part of the US in Colorado. And on a recent residency, artist residency I did in France, um, I got to see a show of some European 3D printed work. And here are some examples of that work. You can see the texture of the rings of clay that are being put down by the 3D printer. They create a very subtle texture on the surface. Um, we go some more. This was a stunning show. In fact, the 3D printing technology has a limit in terms of scale. And this was, these are the largest pieces I had seen done with that technology. They're about 18 inches tall. They can also work with different colored clays to embed color right into the piece. It was, it was at this point where I was uh, looking at all of this, this work and, um, and thinking about what's going on with technology and ceramics that I met uh, an architect who was teaching at Syracuse Architecture on a one-year fellowship, Linda Zhang. And she needed my help to run a class with slip casting ceramics, uh, which, which I was happy to do. And they were making a project that was based on uh, the, an, a monument to the Erie Canal, which is along Erie Boulevard, and made a, their own rendition of that monument in slip cast clay uh, as a class. And I helped them throughout that project and by the end of the semester, we had, were collaborating on projects of our own and formed a group called Haptic Lab, which also includes an architect at Cal Poly in California, uh, Claire Olson, and a fellow who's a specialist in all kinds of digital fabrication and has the lab at uh, Toronto Metropolitan University, Jonathan Anderson. A variety of students were able to also help on these projects. So, that was exciting. And, and at that time, we were invited to work with a firm called Boston Valley Terracotta in Buffalo, uh, uh, where they host an annual research and development uh, workshop and invite teams in to try projects and use any of their resources. Um, and I wanted to show you a little bit about Boston Valley Terracotta. So I'm going to get some help getting us to this link. I believe this is how it, okay. Believe. Can you see it? No. no? Okay, that's what I was afraid of. Awesome. 
Yeah, you have to do it like this. Where the sweet. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Hannah. Now, you guys can also go to this link yourself. This is just the Boston Valley Terracottas website. And they have a confusing name because they're not in Boston. They're in Boston Valley, which is outside of Buffalo, New York. And uh, it's owned by a fellow named John Krause, who graduated in ceramics uh, engineering at Alfred and bought an old flower pot shop and has turned it into a state of the art uh, architectural ceramics firm putting up siding on buildings all over uh, major cities around the world. Um, and I'll just open up a couple of these to give you a sense of just the amazing work they're doing with ceramics and tile in all climates too. It's, uh, it's been fascinating to work with them. So being invited to their research and development conference was a really a big deal for us. Um, this is a museum, I believe in Florida, um, just uh, really quite a range of, of work they're doing in detail they're able to get at this scale uh, and to, to engineer it safely for buildings. But their focus had to be primarily on engineering because it had to work in the real world and in all kinds of climates. Um, so what we noticed when we saw the work was that they weren't doing very much in terms of uh, color and surface to the panels themselves. The panels became the structure uh, of their design. And we thought we could maybe add something in terms of um, information that on these panels. And so we did a project uh, also based on the Erie Canal with them. And uh, so now I'm gonna jump back to some of our early research. So if we can go back to the PowerPoint. Yeah. Back to slide for you. Does that work? Okay, well, we can just go forward. We're getting the. Uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, we're not in. Excuse me. Can the, the 3D printing, um, you said that it has the rings on it, but are the rings actual, actually um, textural also? Yeah. So in. If you wanted to mask those, it's still going to come through. It's not merely a, a, a shading uh, effect from the printer. It's no, it's physical. Texture. You can. It's a texture. Okay, uh, Errol, could you just repeat the question so they can hear it on Zoom? Yeah, the question was with the three D printed ceramics, where you can see the rings where the printer has moved across the the different points of a program where it's asked to place the clay. It leaves this sort of ring like texture. Uh, on the form, and you can feel that it's textural. Uh, it's not just a visual, like sometimes clay can have different tonalities to it and it could give that appearance without being textural, but this is a, something physical. And some artists do try to remove it because they just want the form, not that surface. And so they, you can also uh, scrape it off, you know, and smooth it out if you want to. But like traditional wrong. filament printing, you get very similar texture. Huh. <laughs> So we started uh, to work on this project as a team, uh, Jonathan Anderson, Claire Olson, Linda Zhang and I, uh, and these, we went out to the factory and got these panels to start to practice with. And some of the early tests, you know, getting a, robots aren't as smart as you think, and they only do what you tell them to do, um, but they can operate just like a 3D printer, but uh, on a much bigger scale. So they can move across an X, Y, or Z axis, which just means, can they see me? You know, X and Y are like the, the, the two dimensions in a two dimensional work, width and height, and Z is depth, which makes it three dimensional. And so these, all the 3D programming softwares operate in a space where you can design in all three dimensions. Um, and there's also some really cool new tools that are uh, high-end 3D scanners that can scan any three-dimensional object 
and move it into this space to be manipulated, rescaled to a different size, printed out to any of these tools. So it's, uh, it's been a lot. So we started doing some testing. Um, of course, the robot is just an arm and whatever tool is on the end of the robot, you have to design and create. So we started with some very simple ceramic uh, sculpting tools and we were using some imagery from uh, an artist named Vassarelli. This one we particularly liked as a group just because of its uh, sense of abstraction. And um, I don't know, there were just qualities about it that everybody was, I guess the snow in Syracuse, it reminded us of too. Um, and you can see the, the one thing about the robot that we learned was that it doesn't understand materiality. It has 10 tons of force that it can apply. It could move right through you without even knowing you're there. Um, and so it doesn't have the sense of touch that a human hand has when it works with uh, a material like clay. It just knows the points on various programs it's been asked to go to and the, the movement it's been asked to make, but it has no sense of the material it's working with. So that's something we, we, we became interested in. Uh, this is a video. I don't know if it'll play. Probably won't play. Oh, no, it's playing here, but it's not playing there. Okay. So we've 3D printed some rollers with some imagery from the Erie Canal Museum from the Waylock building and see how we could sort of... Um, I'm really curious, can I go lower and then go backwards? Um, I also tried working at a large scale, which was very comfortable for me in my studio and to work with my bare hand. Um, and then translate that to a tile by using a 3D scanner and then a CNC router to print it out. So this is the original piece I made in my studio just with clay and sponge and water and about 250 pounds of clay. It's about six feet long. And then uh, after we scanned it and uh, we reprinted it in wood, and this is at a scale of like three inches by six inches. And I don't think I could sculpt this as easily at this scale as I could make it at the larger scale where I could use my whole hand. Um, and then this became a mold for tiles and became a uh, backsplash in a kitchen. And now we've come to the project we did for Boston Valley. And we're gonna show a video of the research we were doing and the thinking behind it. Hello. Is that the one? Yeah, and if we can, yeah, after you click it, go full screen. Yeah. Thank you all for joining us today. We are excited to be here and bring you on a virtual tour of our work. We are Haptech Lab, and we're pleased to present our work entitled Beyond the Surface, the Behavior of Digital Ceramics. In this project, Haptech Lab uses industrial robotic arms to push industrial ceramic manufacturing beyond the surface. So our work challenges the disconnect between digital fabrication and the haptic qualities of material behavior and develops a digital materiality based on tactile robotic feedback rooted in craft traditions. The team seen here is comprised of a consortium of artists, architects, technologists, interior designers, academics, and practitioners based in Toronto, New York, and California. We met throughout the year, sometimes in person, uh, but more recently, mostly via Zoom. The largest co cohort of the team is based at Ryerson School of Interior Design, uh, and thankfully that group was permitted to return to the Ryerson Creative Technology Lab at FCAD around mid-July, where we've been continuing our physical studies, uh, and you can see that here in Zoom uh, with the robot in one of the screens. The team developed design research questions to establish parameters and expectations for our research on digital material behavior, asking, how can we translate the haptic qualities of handmaking via digital craft? 
And further, how can the material behavior of digital ceramics create new opportunities and possibilities beyond hand making and beyond simply the performance optimization of hand making effects? Drawing on our diverse backgrounds in both ceramic arts and fabrication craft, it was critically important for us to integrate robotic processes in a way that imbues the haptic qualities of handmade ceramics. The images scrolling on the screen are some of our studies, which we will discuss later in this presentation. In tackling this problem of translating haptic emotive qualities into digital making, we looked at both ceramic arts and historical architectural ceramic projects, most of which were crafted by hand. Looking at the experience of architectural ceramics is really to understand the building skin as a surface that produces a phenomenological experience at two scales, the tactile scale and the optical scale. These interactions with the building surface are part of the urban experience, walking down a sidewalk or viewing a building across the street or a few blocks away. Our goal was to embed the surface with both detail at a small scale and narrative at a large scale to enable multiple readings at different points of view. In this chapel of souls in Porto, Portugal, for example, the individual tiles, each with incredible detail, aggregate together to create lively scenes. Across the street, we can more clearly see the stories of saints, lives depicted at the scale of rooms. Further away from the building, the details become textures in rich blues, which give depth to the building surfaces and vibrancy to the context. This phenomenon is one example of Leatherborough's term surface architecture, which points to the building facade as an instrument of identity and engaging its surroundings. Simply put, building surfaces communicate. Harnessing this potential proved to be fertile grounds for us in this project, where we were asking questions about legibility and meaning and ways to achieve these in architectural ceramics. Historical architectural ceramic projects ranging from those by Louis Sullivan to Ethos Bokeo demonstrate that clay is a productive medium for creating architectural effects, including color, texture, diffusion, and reflectance. Textures from rough to smooth can generate a sense of depth. In addition to architectural precedents, we also turn to those from ceramic arts to unpack qualities that engage the viewer haptically. Reflecting on these traditions, we began at the tactile scale by working with the clay by hand, looking at typical forms of making like casting, stamping, molding, and bas relief to create detailed ornamental tactility. Starting from the standard set of clay tools, we worked intuitively to produce haptic surfaces through multi-layered textures. Recording manual manipulations of clay allowed us to observe the behavior of the terracotta clay body and record impressions made by human touch. Because of the density of the clay and the need for speed in the factory setting, we realized that the robot was a critical partner when scaling up haptic processes to industrial fabrication. Our next step was to transition towards recreating these haptic tactile experiences through the robotic arm. Here we can see our very first experiments with the robotic tooling on Boston Valley Terracotta's standard terracotta extrusions. We simply attached a ceramic hand tool to the end of the robotic arm to mimic hand marks. It became immediately clear that direct translation between the hand and the robot would need skill development in terms of operation, material behavior, and produced effects. At this stage, the robot was operated using manual controls to better understand the forces the robot exerted on the clay. The clay used in Boston Valley Terracotta's manufactured products is extremely dense, so the robot provides strength to manipulate it, up to 150 kilograms of force. However, because of its strength, it essentially treats the clay as a non-material. It carves through it without sensing how the clay is behaving or even sensing that it is there at all. And so we needed to develop a process to program craft and materiality into the tooling that teaches the robot to account for the behavior of the clay. We saw great potential in making use of the robotic arm in an industrial post-extrusion process which would develop a new kind of digitally tooled haptic experience. We found that layering impressions in the clay created a richer surface and chance material behavior. This is one of our first custom made end effectors. The repetition and slight variation in terms of the tooling and the way we overlapped clay marks to create variations in material behavior, we were starting to come close to developing craft skill in the robot to mimic our initial hand manipulations. We then simultaneously approached the project from another perspective, the optical distance. 
For this aspect, we worked with an image that could operate at an architectural or urban scale. Using an image from the archives of the Erie Canal Museum of Syracuse, we tested various ways the image could be made through impressions in the clay surface. Working with wet, unfired terracotta extrusions from the factory, we explored the use of common hand stamping tools, like these embossed 3D printed rollers. Multiple rollers were printed using variations of height field images wrapped on the roller surface. An array of 3D printed end effectors were designed and fabricated at various scales, lengths, widths, and depths in order to test the legibility and textual qualities of the impressions. One such exploration was the role of color in image legibility and haptic qualities. Applying Terra Sigillata allowed us to create layers of color, providing contrast and therefore legibility at various distances. We were also interested in the indexical relationship between clay color and the physicality of sites of extraction. We explored using clay from the banks that feed the Erie Canal to produce the Terra Sigillata. So the colors would reveal the materiality of the site itself in both a symbolic and embodied way. We then explored a variety of 3D printed rollers differing in scale and geometry. Throughout the experimentation, we sought to create and test legibility of the image at varying distances. We found a depth limitation in this process. To be legible from afar, the roller needs to be scaled proportionally in depth. This is not always possible within the thin surface of the extrusion panel, as we can see in this chart. We also explored different types of roller geometries, including those that would roll in a long linear manner to produce surface tessellation patterns simply through rolling. This included an oloid roller, tricylinder rollers, and wobbly rollers, which are cylindrical rollers clipped at various angles to roll along a wave-like line. Ultimately, we found we were limited by the roller. As the image gets larger, it was difficult to embed the density of details required to produce tactile qualities at a haptic distance. What became evident is that the embossed roller method images seem to only work well when scaled at a single terracotta panel. When you tried to scale up the roller to produce an image across multiple panels, not only was this highly uneconomical in terms of roller material acquired, but also insufficient in terms of the legibility from afar and the haptic qualities from up close. Here we encountered a common problem of digital fabrication and design. Digital images can be infinitely detailed, but those nuances don't translate to clay in the same way. Clay doesn't always want to be digitally precise, and digital 3D modeling is unable to precisely simulate the behavior of clay. Instead, all materials are quasi non-materials, materials who have no character and no behavior. Yet, clay deforms, its moisture shapes how it forms ridges and builds up, how it sticks to the tool or peels off. This unpredictability was precisely our interest in the digital process. And so we returned to some of our early tooling methods, learning from the pressure required to affect the surface topography. We fabricated a series of tools as extensions of the robotic arm. We found the more compelling textures to be those that suggested pointillist paintings and bas relief sculptures, textures that are familiar and haptic. This type of craft sensibility allows us to move beyond the novelty of the robotic technology towards an artistic end, one of our team's primary goals. At the same time, we saw the potential for this method to produce a type of digital manufacturing economy. Any image or textual pattern could be programmed at the same cost using the same tools. With the robotic arm, the economy of production is no longer that of matrices, no longer finding economy by making numerous identical copies from molds or stamps. Instead, the logic of automation uses economy of movement, where each movement per second costs the same as any other movement. And with the capability of moving at a pace of 2.3 meters per second, programming custom images for robotic stippling had scalability potential. In our early attempts at using this method to create an image, the results fell flat, literally. Seen here in this image is a panel tooling of someone you might all know at ACOT 2017. This early test didn't leave room for a feedback loop between the digital design process and the material behavior that corresponds. Here, the terracotta panel was still being treated like a non-material. Tooling was based on images produced in a grasshopper script, which assigned various diameters of circles based on light and shadow. This was directly applied as a tool depth to the clay surface using a tapered pick to make impressions. The resulting panel was not compelling materially, nor were the images even legible. 
And so we realized that we needed to stop trying to predict or control the outcome of the digitally tooled clay. Instead, like we did by hand, we started by simply making marks, this time through various randomized computationally scripted points, just as an artist might repeatedly make the same action to see what might shake out. We also treated the digital process in the same way, developing a feedback loop between the haptic qualities produced rather than trying to make the clay conform to a premeditated image. We started from a series of densely packed gridded points and moved towards random seed generated points, varying both density, spacing, depth, and radii of marks. We also developed a five-sided tool making use of the six axes of movement of the robotic arm for continuous tooling of varying marks. In this way, with our robot collaborator, we began building skills over time with training in the form of altering programming and tools to exploit the central qualities of the resulting material effects and produce a feedback loop. Dense and overlapping marks, the scale of fingerprints on slip colored clay created literal and phenomenal logical depth to the surface. We evaluated these surfaces based on surface qualities and textures, matte and gloss finishes, its potential to catch light and how it might reflect its surrounding environment. In this regard, we were also interested in how these digital haptic terracotta surfaces might also interact with other reflective materials, namely glass. Reconsidering the tooled terracotta extrusion as a mold, a series of experiments were conducted at Corning Museum of Glass to explore how our digitally tooled surfaces might inform the behavior of molten glass. First, a cavity mold was created for a blown glass vessel. The tooled faces were set up to form a cavity and clamp tight and pre-coated with graphite release agent. A calibration tool was used to pre-size and pre-shape a molten glass bubble, which was then lowered into the cavity and blown using a blowpipe. The vessel was rolled, centered in shape using the flame and the blowhole was cut off in cold working. Experiments were made with clear and colored glass to test optical effects of the pattern. Second, a press mold for cast glass was explored. A thick glass slab was cast into a steel frame. The tooled terracotta surface was pressed onto the glass slab for several seconds, then released. This generated a transferred pattern. Finally, a surface mold for set and press glass was tested. This thick glass slab was flipped onto the mold, allowed to set for a couple of seconds, and then pressed into the clay to pick up the tooling. As with our terracotta experiments, we hope to develop a feedback loop between the digital tooling of the terracotta panels, here used as molds, and the material behavior of glass. Our next step was to apply these sensibilities about digital materiality to a large scale image with the goal of producing a surface that operates at both optical and haptic scales. Sampling the qualities of the most successful haptic surface tests, we assigned them to different regions within the image. In the final stages, we undertook a series of performance optimizations. Because of the robot's six axes of motion, you can have up to five tools on one end of arm tool and seamless changing between tools. We also calibrated the relationships amongst the impressions made by the larger tools in combination with detailing achieved by smaller tools to reduce tooling time and accelerate the process. Our KUKA robotic arm can move about 2.3 meters per second. Thus, our post-extrusion tooling procedure can easily keep up with the speed of industrial production, especially when executed in full automation in a closed cell system. Multiple robots can also work side by side to produce an endless variety of images, patterns, and textures. Through careful design of the end effectors and its operations, our team was able to create highly dense textures at high speeds. Ultimately, we aim to produce an image that performs beyond the surface. This piece aims to be experienced not as a static image, but in motion relative to its viewers. As we move towards the image, the figure begins to fade as its tactile qualities become more vivid. In the spirit of this virtual conference, we hope to bring this experience to you through our VR exhibition at www.haptechlab.com, where we invite you to explore the one-to-one -one scale mock-up from a variety of distances. We also hope you will join us virtually in both the Creative Technology Labs at FCAT in Toronto at Ryerson University, as well as the Ceramic Studios at Syracuse University in Syracuse, New York, to see more of the processes, experimental failures, and successes of this project. If you're joining from home, there we go.
Okay, you can just talk. Yeah, we're already in. Yeah, you can talk. Now. Hey, thanks everybody. I know that video was kind of long and you can see it at hapticlab.com if you want to look at it again. It was made for the, uh, what uh, was referred to as ACAW in the video is the, the Architectural Ceramics Assemblies Workshop, which is the R&D workshop at Boston Valley Terracotta. And this was just, uh, this is also on our website where you can kind of see the different qualities of this piece. And this is the piece that's now in the pit at the Erie Canal Museum but you can just see it at different, uh, different, different uh, distances where it, it sort of falls apart as you get close and becomes pure texture and, and sense of hand and touch. And from a distance, it reads uh, as an image. And I will be the first to admit that we're really at the beginning of this research and we haven't, we don't feel like we figured it out, but we've been having some fun uh, trying to figure it out and we'll keep, we'll keep at it. And thanks for joining us today for your uh, for your lunchtime lecture. I've enjoyed being here. Thank you. If there's any questions, I'm happy to uh, to answer them or try to. Uh, if anyone has questions, feel free to ask in the chat on Zoom or if you want to go back to the Zoom. Yeah. Uh, I have I have a question that um oh my goodness so. Uh, would you like to talk more about the, where is the start video button? <laughs> uh, more about getting the clay from local river systems. Sure. Um, and should I put my video uh, on? It's okay. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> um, oh, they can see me anyway. Um, so yeah, we we um, I live in the countryside near Syracuse, and uh, often walk. That was my dog. They got a brief cameo in the in the video, and it's also interesting to note that a lot of this project was happening during the pandemic, and that's why we were on Zoom a lot to work because we couldn't actually be together, and it was kind of perfect timing because I was trying to figure out how to teach a studio ceramics class on Zoom which seemed totally impossible. Uh, how would students do this work without the tools and the facilities that we provide at the university? And one thing we did during that time when everybody was sent home and, and my students who had been sent home during the pandemic were sent home as far as Istanbul and as far as China and as far as San Diego. And it, you know, it was just all over the globe. And I learned that the that the geolo there's every country has a geological survey, which will tell you where clay deposits are. And everyone in my class all over the world went and did a clay dig to learn how to find native clay and how to process it into workable clay. And I did a video with my dog to sort of show the process and how to look for it. And we went into one of the tributaries uh, of the Erie Canal that comes out of the Derider Reservoir, uh, which was built, I believe, to serve the flow of the ca canal. And, uh, and we walked the stream bed looking for the uh, evidence of clay in the banks of the stream, and we found some. And then, of course, the clay, which has been pushed by the water of the stream and develops in eddies along stream banks over you know, hundreds of years, is full of sticks and debris and twigs and leaves and rocks. So you have to take some home, you have to dry it out and then push it through a screen to get rid of all of the junk and impurities and then get your clay and then you rehydrate it with water. Um, it's not that hard of a process, but it's a little bit of work and it's good for my students to see, you know, because ceramics is 10,000 years old, how people got their clay to make the work that was made in pre-industrial times. Now our clay comes in boxes and is absolutely perfect and consistent and ready to go, you know, but uh, there was a time when clay to be a potter meant to go find your clay. So we had fun with that. And, uh, and it was uh, some of the clay we brought back and I was able to use with the haptic lab project to make these slips of clay that created the colored surfaces on the tiles that we were producing. Some of which are here at the museum and some of which are available as sort of souvenirs, stuff like that. But anyway, did I answer your question yeah. at all? Okay. 
We have a couple of questions on Zoom here. Okay. Uh, start with the probably easiest one first. Uh, what kind of kiln is used? Uh, well, the kilns at Boston Valley Terracotta to a potter are pretty fascinating because they're gigantic. And they have the, the, the walls and the ceiling of the kiln are on rollers and on something like train tracks so that you can roll the whole kiln off of the work. And the work is then stacked up on shelves in an area where workers can unload it while the kiln has rolled over another collection of work to fire it. And when that's fired, it rolls back. So they had, uh, talking about uh, a kiln big enough to put Oh, at least an entire classroom of third graders inside, you know, um, and the teacher and the principal. Um, a big kiln. These kilns are probably uh, 30 feet square and eight feet tall, something like that, because they are they are putting panels on skyscrapers. And, you know, the history of that ceramics and architecture was that the ground level the street level of a building would be done in marble or stone, and then it would be copied in terracotta clay the rest of the way up because nobody could afford to put marble over all of a hundred story building. So um, there was a ceramics or clay has often been used to impersonate other materials. You can make it look like glass, you can make it look like metal. Uh, there's a lot of range, but uh, um, so yeah, that was kind of interesting to see those kilns. The kilns I use at Syracuse aren't quite so big, but they're fired with gas. Some of them are fired with electricity. Uh, we didn't put any of the panels into wood fired kilns, but we do have those there as well. well speaking of uh, historic ways that use uh, ceramics, and one, uh, one of our questions is, any chance you're planning a 3D print historic replicas of architectural features. For example, Cuban historic roof tiles could be replaced using this technology, they imagine. Yeah, um, it's not something I'm that our group is pursuing, but I see the Boston Valley Terracotta has been doing roof systems, um, uh, which you know are, are guaranteed to last 100 years um, or more. Also, uh, one of the innovations that Boston Valley did because when the firm started, they were doing repairs of older buildings that had used terracotta in the old system that used kind of like bricks and mortar. The panels were all mortared uh, together or they were mortared to the wall and they were grouted kind of like tile. And, and those systems failed over time. And so they found themselves replacing a lot of uh, old systems and it, it caused them to innovate a new system which doesn't use mortar at all. Uh, and all the panels are free hanging. And if there's any problem with a panel, you can replace an individual one without having to take apart the whole system. So they have aluminum uh, hanging systems behind the panels and the panels are kind of considered a rain and weather screen um, and not necessarily the insulation of the building, but they're also using them uh, in, in very warm climates to create shade for buildings and to create uh, to, they, they have an impact on the, the you know, the cost, the footprint, the green greenness or the carbon footprint of the building. Our last question at the moment on Zoom is, uh, how would AI affect teaching the robot? Looked into that at all? Well, it's important to know that in this team, I'm the one who knows how to make things, uh, how, to, how to do the clay. I'm the team member, I'm the only one on the team that has ever really done hand working with clay. Everybody else on the team is either a technologist, a designer or an architect. Um, so, and it's, it's been what's really fun about the collaboration for me is that we all really appreciate the other skills because we don't, they're not ours, but they also appreciate mine in terms of knowing how to make a glaze or a terracigelata or to find wild clay or to fire the kiln um, all of those things were kind of my area that I brought to the team, but I wasn't bringing the digital technology piece uh, to the team, but I was very happy to be able to work with people who understood that and be able to participate in that. So uh, uh, I really learned a lot because potters tend to be loners and 
do most everything themselves. And so forcing myself out of my studio and to work with other people was a very important part of it. Um, I just want you to know I'm not using my phone to call people. I've been taking notes with my phone. Yeah, the, um, yeah, well, your grade will be affected, yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> You're right, exactly. Uh, with the printers, do you think that possibly working in relief will be eliminated? Working in? In relief. With in the sculpting. Oh, you mean in sort of a negative process where you're taking away or, or when no, you... No, in relief. Uh, when you, you carve something in wax and you build a, a plaster um, form around it and then melt the wax out of it and then pour the material into it, it seems that with the printer, you will eliminate that need. Yes, very much so. Wow. And, um, and the other thing we're trying to do in our team is we're trying to turn the robot into a massive 3D clay printer rather than something that holds a tool and makes marks or presses patterns uh, or, or sort of works out the, the points of, a, of an image. Uh, we're trying to hook up a, a giant compressor and tube of clay to the arm so that it, cause it can move in a space uh, 20 feet by 20 feet. Most clay printers can only go up to about 18 inches right, right now. So, It'd be a dramatic shift. And I know there's other industrial projects trying to figure out how to print with concrete, how to print houses uh, that could be more affordable. Um, so there's a lot going on with trying to scale up the printing and how that works. Well, it seems like that would be the, the, the only evolution. I mean, the, the most effective evolution of, of a printer moving away from a printer is actually having the, because the printer has an arm in it anyway, which is Form the material, but with the, and the robot, it would be able to be done on an unlimited scale. Yeah, and the other thing they're trying to evolve, as far as I can tell, is speed, because the robot can go very fast. In this lab, which was at a university, we weren't allowed to put the robot on full speed. Uh, we were using the robot at like one uh, one twentieth of its speed, but you could it could do the same movements and the same marks. Uh, you know, at least 20 times faster if, if we had been allowed to turn it on full speed. Is that for safety? Yeah, it was totally a safety oh, issue. Right. In fact, that whole lab had to be wired so that if anybody was in the room when the robot's on, uh, or like when the robot's on, the doors lock. Yeah. Basically, it's all, it was all interconnected. There was a, the, safety, the, the safety yeah. protocol was much, much higher with that. But uh, with the 3D printers, they're pretty slow. And the CNC routers, which is a different way to carve three-dimensional uh, shapes. Both of those tools, they take a while to do a, a, a program that you've given it to do. They to, seemed so fast when they first came out, but then it eventually... For industrial scale, it's still fairly slow. So mostly they're used, like at Boston Valley Terracotta, they're using those tools to make models, but not for production. Uh, then those things go to molds and they go to slip casting or they go to hand, uh, hand forming. They actually have uh, a number of people employed at that factory as sculptors because all the restoration that work they're doing takes an incredible uh, degree of, of, of ability at, at sculpting by hand. So when they're replacing some of the gargoyles and some of the other elements on the rooftops of these 19th century buildings, uh, those are being done by sculptors which is nice. You don't see a lot of job calls for sculptors anymore. Right, yeah. Yes. That was actually gonna be my question, um, especially as an artist. I think it's really interesting that you're working with these tools. Cause I think that, especially in a lot of artist communities, there's that worry of like, is this going to sort of render my art useless if you take a machine and do larger scale projects with the same medium that I'm working with. So do how, sort of like what's the end goal like how much opportunity like how big do you think that this could get like using these machines to work with clay as a medium like what other things would you like to see happen in the future with it well i'm going to go backwards first with that question because uh in the you know 1880s or whenever the camera was invented painters thought they were being made obsolete and then along came impressionism and van gogh 
and uh, a whole series of people who, instead of being threatened by the camera, were inspired by it. So I think what's happened, uh, you know, the, the first photographs were took, took many hours to expose the image to the camera through the, these tents with peepholes in them. I don't understand the technology exactly, but the exposures were very long. So when people were photographing landscapes at the beginning, you'd see the sense of nature passing by because the exposure was so long. So if leaves had blown across that field of view, if trees had swayed, any of that created blurriness in the early photographs. Some of those painters saw that as opportunity. In other words, they saw it as sort of the fourth dimension of time. So now they weren't just painting a landscape, but they were thinking about landscape over time. And that's where you get impressionism. So I think we could be, I think we just shouldn't be afraid of, of tools and technology. Um, uh, and in ceramics where we got replaced by industry during the industrial revolution and the invention of slip casting and other mechanized ways of making pottery, you know, we were very threatened by that as a field. And now we use those technologies to make art. You know, there's a whole course we now teach on slip casting at the university, something we used to consider to be the sort of the, the evil enemy of industry. You know, that just made the same thing over and over. Well, now we make it, we're making one of a kind pieces using that technique. So uh, I think we shouldn't be afraid of, and it's going to happen. I mean, technology and, and new ways of working are going to happen. So we might as well uh, see what we can do with them. Got yeah, one more question here on Zoom. Uh, can you ever envision developing, actually, fits in very well with it last question here as well. Uh, can you ever envision developing an interdisciplinary course for studio and or art history students and computer science students in robotics or user interface design? So some sort of interdisciplinary course for robots. And well, it, you know, it might be interesting to know that Two of the team members of Haptech Lab were my colleagues at Syracuse University at one time or another and went on to other jobs elsewhere. So I'm always looking for people who wanna play uh, in an interdisciplinary way um, within my campus um, so that we can build that kind of a class. And, and 15 years ago, I did build a class like that with an architecture professor that was where we first were introduced to Boston Valley Terracotta and brought the owner and one of his designers over to give a lecture. And then we took the whole class there to have their final work reviewed at the end of the semester. Um, and that was back in like 2010. And that was where I first became kind of fascinated uh, by what they were doing, what the, what the potential there was. I think there's a nascent program at Alfred. I would not be surprised if Alfred had a program like that. But yeah, with with with, um, with robotics uh, and and sculpture. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I I do like working with people who have other skill sets and seeing what can happen when you put put things together. I don't know how many of the various skill sets I can develop myself, you know, in this lifetime, but. Uh, I, I do love working with other people who, who bring ideas to the, how to build that class, I'm not quite sure. We don't even have robots at Syracuse yet, um, but it's interesting. <laughs>